My name is Bill Love. My name is Sharon Lewis. My name is Eileen Atkinson. I'm Rich Del Carlo. Gail Lester. Kim Woodruff, city staff. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to run down the date and time one more time because we were having a technical issue uh, at the very beginning when you were explaining where we were and who we are. Um, so I'm just going to run through that really quick if that's okay. Um, I wasn't recording at the time. We were recording, but we didn't have the audio on. So oh, okay. I'm just going to run through that real quick. Um, this is the Sandpoint Tree Committee. It's um, on uh, Wednesday, May 12th, 2021, 3 p.m., meeting at Sandpoint Community Hall. I'm Melissa Ward, City Clerk, uh, taking minutes. Okay. And um, uh, one member, Molly McCann, is not able to join us today. So I don't know if she sent in any um, comments. She was, I talked to her yesterday. But... Yeah, she did email some comments. And okay. So we can incorporate those into the Good. I did a conversation at the, during the various topics because hers were segregated by the different uh, uh, groups. Yes. Okay, um, I did not see those myself, so I don't know if anyone happened to bring a copy. Um, um, anyway, if you, if you recall any of that, uh, you can uh, bring them up. Let's see. Um, uh, uh, point. I think Melissa can, you know. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm happy at the time um, to read those uh, comments from uh, Long Account. Okay, Depending that would be that would be very helpful, Melissa. Thank yeah, you very much. Help me remember, we need to check in with Molly. Every once in a while, I'll grab those comments depending on what we're talking about. Okay, very good. Um, we have uh, one action item to, to approve the minutes. Um, does anyone have any corrections or additions to the minutes? If not, could we have a motion to approve the minutes as written? So moved. I second. I second. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes as written, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Um, I would uh, like to welcome our guest today, Jim Flock, um, who's going to uh, um, address us our planning for the brief, uh, both the, the City of Sandpoint's uh, Community Forestry Program and the Tree Committee. Um, and I don't know if, uh, Kim, do you want to step in here and, and kind of um, Preface this a bit. Well, yeah, the only thing I want to do is just kind of share that I am extremely excited. I've been here for a long time in this on this excited zone. This is one of the top ones. Uh, uh, we're, we're going as a city and as a community. I was able to debrief a little bit with Jim earlier today. And uh, I think that uh, for our urban forestry and our, our, our public trees, uh, there's, th things could not be brighter. So I, I, with that, maybe turn it over to Jim and he can kind of explain. Uh, I, I will be leaving just so that, and because he's asked for city staff to remove as out of respect for you guys to be able to speak your mind and uh, in, in this process. And so I think that that's a great idea because we all know I can't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, if you've been harboring ill will against Kim, now you get a free opportunity to take the big stuff. Oh, yeah, we have yeah, lots, of, lots of that. Keep in mind, it's being recorded. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kim. Bye. So, as uh, Bob said, and Kim said, my name is Jim Plot. I am with the Community Forestry Consultants out of Spokane. And we work these kind of projects all over the U.S. and Canada, outside of the U.S. as well. So, uh, We've been hired to uh, research and develop an urban forestry management plan for Sandpoint. And that's a many faceted process that involves the inventory, which has been collected. Um, so we'll be looking at that and generating a lot of information from the data that was collected. Uh, the second thing is looking at what resources the city has, both staff, equipment, and money, funding, everything like that. And then the third leg of that three-legged stool is input from the community. And you're part of the community. So we'll be doing this type of activity, not just with the tree committee, but also with 
any city staff that impacts urban forestry. So not just the park people, but it could be public works, it could be planning, things like that. We'll get those people in the same kind of room doing the same activity. And then we'll also the general public as well. So that's the feedback process from the community. So to begin with, um, I'd ask the question, how long have each one of you been on the tree committee? What's your tenure on the tree committee? Starting with Gail. Good question. I have no idea. Many years. I mean, are we talking 20, 30, 40? Oh, well, how long have we been in action? Yeah, I don't know. Like whatever. <laughs> but see, and, and Sandpoint became a tree city, USA, uh, when the urban forestry program was handled by the Sandpoint Independent Highway District, because at the time they had jurisdiction over the, was the that city streets. And so that was, you know, that was probably, I want to say in the early 90s, uh, something, sometime like that. So, and then when the city, you know, took over the jurisdictions of the, of the streets, then that's when the city of Sandpoint formed the, the, the tree committee. And there may have been some people that were on the, the previous committee that mm -hmm. transferred over, but- uh, And what year was that? So yeah. Well, that's what I- <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. say 10 years, I'm, I'm making that up, but a long time. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, fifteen. Yeah, I, yeah. Actually, I was on the way. I've been, I've at least fifteen years. Our yeah. southern gentleman was also uh, Kenny Yeah, yeah. Virginia. I can't believe this, but I'm the most recent, <laughs> and I'm at ten years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well then. Well, and I've been retired from the Department of Lands for 10 years, yeah. and I was on the committee probably four or five years yeah. before that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking that there's one age class of us about 15 years that are that we're all, all together. Okay. Well, I think I'm 15 years for me too. I think our, Rich, Bill and I and Ivan all started on this with the current group at this uh, at the same time. And yeah. I think Gil just came in yeah. like a year later. So there's yeah. so history for sure. We have a lot of, yeah, have a lot of dedicated volunteers here. Good, good. So um, I sent uh, Kim and Jennifer your homework assignment for today. Did you all get that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So that's kind of what we're going to spend the day doing. How many of you ever gone through a SWOT analysis before? Bill, I know you are working for an agency. I'm yeah. sure you have. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. This is a very old, but very effective and useful tool. Um, so it allows a, basically a free form. There's no right or wrong answers. So say whatever's on your mind. So SWOT is strength, weaknesses, which basically focus on the internal part of the city and the programming. Opportunities and threats, typically deal with our, what are some of the external forces that impact what goes on in the city that we may not have control over. So um, I can give you some examples of each one of these to kind of get you started thinking on the line. If you kind of read the, the handout that you uh, received, that's kind of what we're looking for in the whole process. There are some examples on the back of the handout as well. So yeah. you're Gail, you're looking like- you Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get that, but I'll follow through with her. Uh, does anybody, did anybody bring that with the handout? The SWAT, nothing on the back. I just got that. Oh, there was, okay. Yeah, I what's what's SWAT page? page. Oh, okay. Maybe they okay, good. Page. They got misplaced or something. Anyway, but that SWAT it explains it pretty well on the front page too. So, um, you know, like the strength uh, up here would be, um, the uh, older trees in the old part of the neighborhood. A weakness would be the condition they're in. An opportunity would be all the available planting spaces. A threat might be climate issues, drought, water shortages, those kind of things. So that's what you guys are going to do today is you're going to brainstorm under each one of these categories. And of course, it's going to be recorded. And this will become 
input into the management plan and it will provide us areas that we can focus in on in the plan so that it's not just a shotgun approach it's more uh, relative to what's going on at Sandpoint from the feedback we get from the community. So that's where we're at with this. The thing to think about though is some of these descriptions as you come up with for each one of these categories, they sometimes can be under multiple categories. So, so that's kind of how this kind of flows. Get a good idea how this works. <laughs> looking for All right. I'm done talking. You're on. So with the recording going on, please speak loud enough because we'll transcribe it off of YouTube so we can put these comments in. These will actually go into the plan in one of the appendices. So, um, so fire away. I, I, I might just hand it off um, and, and bring up as a, a strength is really this, uh, the, the assets that this three committee brings to the the city forestry community forestry program. Um, we have in our group, you know, considerable amount of both technical expertise, but um, even more important, I think, is just the, the the dedication of these people and their passion and interest in seeing a, a, a viable, um, active uh, urban forestry program and a, a healthy forest canopy. So I, I, I think those are um, two very important things. And one third thing I'll add uh, is that we do have a, a fairly complete street tree inventory uh, with a tremendous amount of data in it. It's, um, of course, it's always a work in progress, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's been built up for, um, that, we've been working on that for over 10 years. I think that's a, also a big uh, asset that we have here. Anyway, anyone else can just. Oh, let, me, uh, yeah. let, let me, excuse me, <laughs> anyway, let me interject uh, Molly's uh, comments for strings because uh, they do uh, relate to the, the Sandpoint Tree Committee, uh, this group here. And she says, this group has career long experience in tree management, health, and species. Uh, recognized tree experts in the community, uh, and she mentions the, those of us that have, uh, have uh, professional experience. And then she goes on to say, I was trained in landscape architecture and understand both the design, aesthetic, and environmental benefits of trees in an urban and rural environment. All members of the committee are very passionate about trees and the role they play in a healthy community. Mm -hmm. All have been in Sandpoint for many years and are dedicated to the community and are well known in the community, which uh, benefits public outreach. Oh, nice. Well. <laughs> so, Bill, did she have anything under the other categories? Yes. Go ahead, go ahead and read her stuff. Oh, okay. Reading. All right. Yeah. 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 She has a short paragraph for each of the, of the, the categories. Her weaknesses, uh, she points out, as volunteers who work are, are who are busy, we have limited time to devote. Uh, the effort of an urban plan is almost entirely dependent upon the landowners' interest in trees, tree selection, maintenance, removal requests, community engagement. Then under opportunities, uh, community events, grant submittals, uh, and she illustrates with a Pine Street sidewalk project that's uh, going to be going on this summer. Uh, uh, submittal, grant submittals being involved in the grant writing would also be an opportunity and also knowing the prioritization for new sidewalks. Working with the Vista Corporation during the power line trimming and so on would, would be opportunities. Then under threats, uh, she lists when landowner fear of trees, the, their ability to grow large in the community, uh, drought or lack of maintenance and threat to plan if a percentage of landowners don't have the same vision. Mm -hmm. So those are Molly's comments. Mm -hmm. So right, jump back. right in with okay, any, and you in. don't have to start with strengths. If you got, um, if something comes well, up in your I'm, head that's an opportunity or threat, go for it. I'm gonna follow what Bob said, and this is something that means a lot to me, and I think it does to every member of the community. And, and our strength as a team 
And I don't know if that's because we've had good leadership or because we are who we are or because the leaders picked us because we are who we are, but that has happened. We have come together and a few new people and then we had a few new people last year and the year before who also worked just well with us and we hardly ever have words. <laughs> Lots of information. I think everybody feels free to express. There's no, I don't feel a threat in our team at all. Let's say some of the biggest threats to the um, uh, overall urban forest is the um, is the, the growth that's going on right now. It has been. Everybody is trying to squeeze 17 rental units onto a piece of property. Um, and with that comes the desire to cut down city trees that are on the right of way because they want another access or something like that. So the threats I think are development. Um, obviously we have um, tremendous threats given the uh, some of the weather that's that we've been having. And um, and one of the weaknesses, some of the weaknesses could be that, um, you know, for a long time, um, we have, we were an advisory committee, um, but, you know, we see things that are uh, going on where, where somebody has cut down a tree. Um, there's, there's no um, avenue really to enforce that, to put any teeth in the, you um, uh, the, what's the, the law, it's not the law. The ordinance. The ordinance, thank you, yes. yes. Um, so there's, you know, we've, we've been here, we've been advising, but still, um, despite our best efforts, things still um, are kind of coming down. And I, and I see that threat as increasing right now, um, given, I mean, it's just kind of progress, but given the, the given the path that the, the whole county is on and the state itself, um, I, I think it's really important that, um, that we have some, that we have these, everything that we have in place to be followed through and to continue to place the value of trees in high, in high regard and not, and not lower down on the total pole. Yes, we have no power to follow through on anything. So that has been disappointing. So what do you consider that? A weakness, what? a threat, or an opportunity, or a strength? Oh, a category. Mm. Yes. <laughs> right, yeah. All of, the above. All of them. That's a strength, too? No. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a threat. Okay. And, it, and it's ever-present. Yeah. So and it is go. also an opportunity to do better. Right. Okay, there. <laughs> That's what I was getting. Usually with threats, there's opportunities to fix the threats. Oh yeah, there's hope. We've come a but long specifically, way. specifically, what kind of hope? That's a vague term. But I mean, hope in that things can change and that we will figure out a way to be able to police our, I don't know, our standards so that we have something to say and not just spinning our wheels. And I think to, to, to add to that, um, one of the things I consider a weakness here is, is um, when we started out, I mean, we were just really isolated. We just had our own little, I mean, we're like in a, like a silo, I guess that's the term they're using these days for, for groups that are isolated from other groups. And we just kind of did our own thing um and um and then things would happen within the city and we say well well how did that happen and why didn't they talk to us about that or or you know a new development goes in and there are um, some issues with the, the trees selection or the trees where they're managed or, or something that we could have i think assisted with um but we were never involved in a lot of that. Um, I think when when uh, Jared came on as um, city forester, things definitely improved. But 
but I think there's still a lot of room for improvement to, to integrate what we are doing and what we can offer to the city. Uh, I think there's still a lot of uh, room for improvement in, in how we can in interact with the city. Uh, and, and I mean, what I would like to see eventually is, is um, you know, a time when any, any new building permit or plan comes into the planning department um, that involves trees and they need to ask that question on the permit, you know, what, how does it impact the trees? Are there any trees on the property? Um, that if there's um, any any effects on the trees um, or impacts on the trees that we need to have some sort of way to review that and, and suggest a uh, way to uh, reduce or uh, eliminate the, the impacts on those trees. So that's, that's, uh, that's what I consider a big weakness, but like I say, it's, it's, it has improved and there's room for more improvement, but uh, I think it takes a while to, to um, you know, change city culture, the mm -hmm. city employees, and, and get them in that frame of mind where they're they're uh, they're going to think that and think about that, uh, that aspect of a, a process. Yeah, one of the big things that's been the that's been the disjunct the uh, yeah. even between the departments in the city to where. Um, you know, it's, there hasn't been a coordinated effort on it, on just about any of this, even if it's in just sidewalks or whatever, to kind of get everybody on board working from the same uh, knowledge or base. So is that a weakness? That's a weakness. Okay. That would be a weakness. All right. A good example of that is the um, work that was done on Cedar Street. Uh, uh, over a two or three year period. Uh, remember when the engineer and public works came to one of our tree committee meetings, uh, they were ready to start construction. You know, the final engineering plans were, were signed off on, it was ready to go. And we had some, some very important comments about the tree selection, the, 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 the planting spots for the trees and, and that sort of thing. And you know, but by that point, it was just pretty much too late to have, to have any influence on the on the project. Some of the strengths are that you know we were we were uh, we did have opportunity and influence on the um, uh, the structural soil part of uh, part of things that have really been super beneficial to um, to the. To the how things have looked down on, um, in town, Second Avenue, especially. Is that the new development downtown? The pavers and the new trees. And yeah, that, yeah, that was yeah. But there, there, there have been there have been several different processes on different streets where they have tried different things and uh, different species of trees, and so um, which uh, you know we didn't have a whole lot of we didn't we weren't. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of say and influence on Cedar Street and First Avenue. The other, the other streets we did, in, the, in terms of the commit, the committee being involved. But as a result of our previous input, then some of these newer projects are, are starting out being uh, designed with structural soil in place, whereas you know. 15 years ago, then that was that that was a battle that we had to fight from from bare dirt to, to get them to even consider uh, that because that was obviously a, an additional expense to the project. So. Yes. We did get to choose the trees, the species that went in on Cedar. Right. On, on, on Cedar. On Cedar. On Cedar. Yeah. Oh, was yeah. Right on and yeah. So things but, have slightly changed yes. and we are moving ahead, but there's so much more to make us whole and, and have a little bit more. And as far as opportunities, it feels like they're like we're entering a new era after the last couple of tree meetings. And part of that yeah. is, is Kim represents Parks and Rec and his you know, relationship in the, the city. 
and and with us, I think it's going to be a really good thing, it's, especially when it comes to enforcing ordinances and the follow through, which is which is something that we really struggled with. And um, so I am really hopeful that that is an opportunity for us and the city um, to just yeah uh, improve with some of those enforce enforcement threats that we've had or lack of enforcement um, that we've kind of struggled with through the years. I see in some ways the um, kind of the, it does seem that that we are moving in a, in a good direction, but yet there is some tenuous feelings there that, that maybe, um, that, you know, I, I, I was feeling for a while that the, that the tree committee might be um, disbanded or, or not um, in existence anymore. So that would be a threat that, uh, that I felt in the past. And some of that had to do with COVID and just not being able to meet, but yet it felt like things were kind of changing and that we were kind of almost, um, you know, on the, on the fringe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I felt that same way, but the last couple of meetings have, have made me more hopeful. Well, it was, you know, explained to us somewhat belatedly and, and partly because of COVID but the entire city administration was taking a look unknowns to us of all of the, their committees and commissions and developing sort of an internal master plan. And, you know, by the time we found out about it, well then you know, things were in progress. And, then, and that's where I think the last two or three meetings, we've seen the, the effects of, of kind of a, a, a focused city administration and then, then Rather than being forgotten about, like like we, we had the feeling, yeah, that yeah, now we're starting to see uh, kind of the direction that the city is is, is taking. Another threat is the uh, is actually just the infrastructure of a city. Uh, sidewalks, in particular, have always been a huge issue in terms of the you know the health of the tree. We've been trying to squeeze pretend that sidewalks and, and old trees can coexist and they they don't. I mean, that's just, and so um, I hope that that's an opportunity to hopefully preserve some, some of these older trees that are, look for ways to, to um, um, preserve the older trees that are gonna be impacted by whatever, sewer, uh, sidewalks, roads, driveways. Definitely an opportunity if you think outside the box. There you go. Yeah. Um, I have some uh, uh, things to say specifically about our neighborhoods program. Um, <coughs> some of the successes. So, which, let me, let me just hold up a second. Yeah. When you guys discuss these, put them in the framework of what they are, strength, weakness, hmm. opportunity, or threat. Okay. I so broke is the neighborhood, down, neighborhood programs a uh, strength? It's a strength, but it has its weaknesses, its opportunities. There you go. So, so, that's <laughs> so, bring it, so bring it that way. Okay. If it's a, if, that's if it's what a I've program got. Is yeah. A, yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. So yeah. kind of focus in on that. Okay, so for the successes of the Neighborhoods Program, um, it, it's a unique community program. I think we all take pride in it. Um, and it fosters this relationship between community citizens and the city, um, the city government, city staff. Um, and it has, um, it, how long, the Neighborhoods Program is about what, 12, 13 years old? It has successfully increased the canopy <laughs> in in our city. Um, our what is is it something like eight hundred trees? I think it's about eight hundred. Mm -hmm. um, have been planted over the years. Um, uh, a weakness is they haven't all survived, <laughs> but most of them have, mm -hmm. and um, so that is a success. One of the weaknesses um, I see with the, the the neighborhoods program 
is we struggled with public outreach and trying trying to get more people interested and aware of the program. Um, so what, the weakness maybe is kind of lack of communication, just kind of finding that difficult for some reason, um, public relations around neighborhoods. Um, and, and then also the difficulty in, in the public maintaining the trees after they're planted um, is, is, uh, is a weakness, but that also maybe involves a uh, lack of communication, um, but it's also just the reality that you can't completely control it. Um, um, and opportunity as far as neighborhoods is, it already exists. <laughs> like there's a, such a great foundation for that program. And, and we can only just like improve upon it. So the fact that it's already there, already exists. Funded. We've been, it's funded. And our, yeah. we, we've been, have, we have had these opportunities of trial and error and what works and what doesn't. And I think it's just gonna get better because of that. Um, and then the threat is, um, again, just kind of uh, having to rely on the public to follow through with uh, caring for a tree that they committed to care for. Um, you know, the challenges that the property owners change. So the next one comes along and, and doesn't have you know, the, the interest or the passion for the tree that the, the one who planted it did. So we're, we're always going to be up against those kind of challenges. Um, but it's also just, again, goes that the threat is if we can't get over some of the public relation uh, hurdles and, um, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and not maybe doing a better job of inspiring people to plant and maintain their trees, um, we could always do better at that. So that's that's just specifically the SWAT for um, our our uh, very special <laughs> neighborhoods tree yeah. planting program. Thank yeah. you, Shannon. Great, right. a weakness to the whole system, to the whole process, everything is the, is the, the weird ownership. Um, yeah. Right. These are your trees. You have to take care <laughs> of them. You need permission to cut them down, you have to have somebody qualified to take care of them. Um, so there's, I don't know, it just is, is a weakness that, yeah. um, that is nobody really understands, you know, and, um, and yet you're supposed to put a sidewalk in if you have, do a bunch of um, improvements, improvements on, your, on your property, but yet you have these trees there. So it's, um, that, that whole ownership, the whole right away, is, I mean, that's a weakness. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Keep it going. Um, one of our, oh, I don't know what category you put it in, but we would like to work on a heritage tree program mm -hmm. where our mm -hmm. great trees are already here and flourishing, but we don't have anything to kind of protect them. We're not sure how to move ahead. We have looked through other people's uh, programs, but that's something that we dream of working harder to accomplish. So and that would be an opportunity. Then. Thank that's you. <laughs> an opportunity, but the, the threat exists that if you don't get this in place, those trees won't those be. Those trees could potentially disappear. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity and a threat. Like I said, often those two are linked together. I, I think um, along those lines, um, a lot of people in this area are, are very concerned about private property and, and government regulations concerning private property. And we did we did draft up a, a heritage tree program, um, but it was really not, it was sort of a way to highlight and honor these trees, but not, didn't really offer any Protection. real protections. I, you know, uh, the way we had drafted it up was that people could sign up for this and we could have their tree on our heritage tree list and we could publicize those trees. But um, at any time that they chose, they could they could drop off the list. 
So there is no real long term protection there. Um, but I think there, there was a lot of concern that the public would not, um, <clears throat> or the city council perhaps, would not be in favor of having a, a, a hard tree program that had a lot of teeth. So, so um, is there an opportunity to revisit that? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, because there was a lot of work put into that that draft, um, mm -hmm. and so that is a, that is a success, right? Yeah. Because that work was was done, and um, but yeah, the threat is it haven't really followed through that because there were a lot of intimidating kind of circumstances <clears throat> but, but maybe we should revisit that i think the challenge is is, is um coming up with something that's going to be agreeable to the city yeah. government i mean if we were just drive, drawing on ourselves um we might make it very differently than what we might think um City Council would agree to. <laughs> so, yeah. so Gail has a, I don't know how we started it, the mm -hmm. library, the displays at the library. We have a good connection to our library. Um, they're willing to work with us. Uh, so, how many times have you done this? Sharon, really? I know. Oh, will you give us? Yes. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> we keep passing along. Yeah. Certain no, no, we've all worked on Yeah, we all worked yeah. on it, but Sharon's been the leader on that one. Well, that, certainly our relationship with the library and putting on displays is a, uh, is a success <clears throat> yes. and an opportunity to continue to do that in the future. And that is a, a public relations tool um, that's worked uh well for us and uh um the the threat was during covid the library you know had um th there wasn't the the opportunity to actually put on the display this past fall um but hopefully that will be changing we'll have that opportunity again um but it's a good reminder that that is available to us for um public you know, as a public relations tool. Um, oh, and another positive thing is our pamphlet that we did so long ago. Yes. We have a little outstanding trees of Sandpoint. And I'm still totally proud of that. And Me going too. around and saying, that tree is still there. Yeah. So yes. that's that's a good thing. We, do we still have copies of that? Must. <laughs> <laughs> But they get out. So yeah. They're not this past year. You can lose some of the memories of these things. There is an opportunity for exactly. us to track down those cases <laughs> of booklets and make sure that they don't yeah. get lost. Because <laughs> that would be and a they threat. Gain the people's hands. <laughs> and Sharon was good about getting. Yeah, I love chats of them out. Yeah. So where do we go now? We haven't. There are none at the library, I noticed. Oh, no. I haven't dropped off any at the library in a long time. Well, it's been but, yeah, but uh, I think I know where they do exist in the city offices. So I'm going to pick on Bob here briefly for one reason. I know he collected most of the data on the inventory. Anytime you do data collection and inventory, it should bring up many things under every one of these categories. And I haven't heard much related to that. Oh, good point. Mm -hmm. You're on. Well, um, just be very specific. You don't have to go into long discussions. Just get the high points. No. Um, well, the, three, the whole inventory thing has been a real work in progress, um, and it's been a real challenge. Um, and most recently, I say recently, about five years ago, we, we switched over to this new system that the Idaho Department of Lands had um, online. Uh, the, I, the I tree or no, the um, tree plotter, tree plotter, excuse me, um, program. Um, and so we've gone from our own database to having this uh, fancier system, and it's a great system, but um, we're not still not completely transferred over. Oh. Um, so as I go through the city, it, it's, it's just it's been a real challenge to try to get them the, the um, tree dots 
we have a dot for each tree now. They, they start out on the property because we just attached them to the property address. So now I have to take them off of each house essentially and put it and get match them to the right tree on along the sidewalks and along the street. So um, mm. that, that's been um, a real slow going, slow going process. But once we have that, that will be a tremendous asset, a tremendous uh, a strength um, to the city. But uh, um, more than luck, opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I think one of the weaknesses also is that uh, I mean, we do identify trees that have some real serious issues. Um, and it's still a little bit um, unclear to me what's, what the process is for that. I, every year I, I produce a list of trees that I consider to be uh, seriously hazard, you know, hazardous. Um, Either with significant decay or more commonly um, things that have cracks in the trunk, um, visible cracks where uh, it looks like the tree starting to separate. Um, but I'm not a certified arborist, and so I refrain from. But I would always encourage the city forester to um, to get a second opinion on all of these. So I give them a list. And then I don't know what happens. So that's sort of a, 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 a weakness, I guess, is that um, we don't have a, a clear policy for that, um, for what's, what should happen to those trees and how they get addressed. And, and if they need to be imminently taken down, who's going to pay for it? So <laughs> that's another thing that um, you know, these are supposed to be the responsibility of the property owner, but um, it's not, uh, it's not clear that they always have the resources to deal with something in a timely way. It goes back to Rich's comment about the conflict of tree on the Yeah. Yeah, exactly the same thing. And, and I, you know, um, you know, and the weak, the real weakness has been, and um, a threat also, has is the fact that the um, uh, the inventory and the the condition of the trees has been is subjective. It's there's no um, there hasn't been a uh, an actual criteria laid out to um, identify those um, uh, you know those potential problems or perceived problems that may not be problems. And, you know, I mean, that's not, that's not a fault, of, it's not um, dissing you at all. That's just the way, you know, I mean, you were, and so, uh, and that's actually what prompted, um, you know, kind of us to, to, to go, Further realizing that the, the um, you know the liability involved with uh, maybe misidentifying or not identifying a, uh, yeah. a hazard. Yeah. One strength of our our inventory, on the other hand, that that really benefited the city several years ago was when the Department of Lands had some grant money available on pretty short notice. And because of the robustness of our inventory, we were, Stephen Drinker was able to submit a, an a grant application and we were accepted. And that gave us a pretty significant amount of money for, for both tree removal and tree maintenance, right? Yeah. Both. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, also along the lines of the inventory and database, it's a success that it even exists, yeah. right? Yeah, yes. like you're saying, yeah. and and Bob has done just such a you know, tremendous amount of work with it. There's so much useful data there, um, but I think as a, a a weakness is we even as a tree committee we forget to utilize yeah. that mm -hmm. sometimes, and it gets overlooked. And it in in one way I think it gets overlooked um, is with canopy analysis. And I'm not completely privy to, you know, how the urban forester has really been using the inventory to 
to really get a, a thorough analysis of canopy around Sandpoint. Maybe that does exist and I'm just not aware of it, but we've talked about in this committee um, identifying those areas around the city that we could target with neighborhoods with tree plantings. And, um, and our weakness is we just kind of talk about it, but it, it doesn't, there isn't a lot of follow through with that either. And, but yet there's this huge opportunity because we have this database and it would be so great to see it utilized more. Well, you know, that's an interesting point. Uh, th this this uh, tree plotter program has tremendous capacity to generate statistics and, uh, you know, summer statistics and uh, cover different areas and look at different, different aspects of the trees, um, you know, both the health and the benefits and all these other factors. But I don't think any of us know how to really get in there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we really could use some training on that to, mm -hmm. to learn how to how to use it, because I, I don't know, I, I could do some rudimentary things, I think, but um, You're still moving dots. I'm still moving dots. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be a great opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And, and to bring that into our meetings every now and then. Well, and, and you know, and, and as a stream, think of the times during our meetings that there's been a question about a tree removal, a request for tree removal or something like that, where we've had, been able to kind of bring up the inventory, you know, on the computer mm -hmm. screen and, and get the information about that tree and maybe some of the neighboring trees or something like that. And, and sometimes we combine it with, you know, photographs taken from the ground uh, and they compare that to our inventory to help us make a decision on, on the, uh, the, the, the tree removal request. So you, you all mentioned the, an urban forester here. I've not met that person who didn't know that there actually is an urban forester in Sandpoint. Officially a title position? Yeah, we no. had him. There's SWAT for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. why I brought it up because I keep hearing this urban forester I, in Sandpoint I mean, and I, I don't actually, know who that is. We don't have one now. Right? We don't, we, we had one. Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes. If I may, um, the Parks and Recreation Director, Tim Woodruff, Tim Woodruff is the current urban forester. Okay. Oh, yeah. And that's an, that's an appointment by the city. Mm -hmm. But I think what, what Jim is, is getting toward is have we ever had a, a professionally trained forester rather than a city staff member that was assigned? This is your, um, your, your huh. position. Yeah. But wouldn't, that, wouldn't Jared have been? No, he, no, he was the GIS. Yeah, he had a, had, has a degree in biology, but no specific training or experience directly in, in urban forestry. Huh. And, and that leads me back to, I know you're tired of hearing me say it two or three times a year. It's kind of, you know, one, one of the visions that I've had for this area is, you know, not necessarily a full-time urban forester for Sandpoint, but for what I call the Quad City, you know, area here, uh, uh, Sandpoint, Ponderé, Kootenay, and, and Dover, would there be enough enough momentum there, the funding, uh, you know, that that that, that to have a full time uh, professional urban forester servicing this this area? Boy. <laughs> and then the cities think, would be paying for that. Is that where how they would be funded? Well, that would be that, yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Called stepping up. Yeah. <laughs> well, Stephen Richard was uh, previously called the urban forest. Yeah. Right. And uh, after he left that job, he got another one which worked with tree committees or trying to start tree committees. Yeah. Uh, and he found we were the only city or town around this area that was interested and was working on it, had been working on it. So um, it would be an opportunity for us to explore it. We, I don't know how much, how far we get because we got it. He's tried others, other cities, getting started and that's not been successful that people don't have. It, it may be a population problem. All those towns are very small. Well, we place such a, uh, an emphasis 
on the trees, being a tree city USA. And, um, but um, the fact is that that the position, the urban forester position, was just a default thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have you're you're doing this. Well, now you now you add this on, and that's what you, that's also what you're doing mm -hmm. secondary to your primary tax, which mm -hmm. you're being paid for. Mm -hmm. So we have never had a actual trained, experienced um, <clears throat> urban forester. I mean, and frankly, they've all everybody in that position has relied on those of us that have some knowledge to to help them through that position in terms of whatever tree identification or um, health or planting or any of that. <clears throat> yeah i think and i guess i've always called it a city forester rather than the urban forester but interchangeable but, but, um yeah interchangeable so that's a weakness of us Oh, that was just presented there. Yeah, yeah. it's also an oh, What a huge yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's exciting to think about the possibility of having a trained, full time, dedicated yeah. person in that position. But it's also just the threats when you really start to think about it like, how does it get funded? Yeah. Like, how do you even like um, pr present that idea to the city? Uh, it, it seems like such a hurdle to even know where to where to start but it is worth considering how we might approach that possibility because it would make a huge difference to sandpoints urban forest to us um uh if we had a full-time dedicated ex, you know expert in that position and it adds it adds credibility to the entire right to the entire scene to the entire process. Yes. it adds credibility it also adds stability to yeah. the program yes you know because here's a here's a full-time employee you know dedicated right. to urban forestry not just a uh, an add-on assignment to another another city employee students so sharon you just mentioned uh, in your comments there one word that has not come up thus far as something that needs to be dealt with in this little exercise. One word. Funding. I was just going to say funding, but it was too slow. Funding. So what is that? Do you guys have enough money in standpoint to do everything you want? No, no. <laughs> well, I haven't heard that word yet. That's pretty common. However, the... didn't our city pay for you guys to come and enrich us or, a or guide? Oh, oh good. <laughs> that doesn't grant monies. No. So that's so yeah, we don't see a lot. We're lucky that we have our budget that we can buy our trees with for neighborhoods and have them planted, I feel. So how do other cities our size do it? And do you, are there are many other cities our size out there who do have a full time dedicated urban forester? I, I don't know the answer to that, but those would be good questions maybe to start asking, researching. Um, but I I do think that it's an enormous obstacle. The you know the possibility of finding funding for a full time urban forester, um, but. Is it worth at least, you know, getting some preliminary um, data research? Some of those questions you asked, I, I won't answer today, but they will be answered in the plan. Okay. And there's, it is no doubt about it, it's a challenge, but there are ways to beat that. And get I think that we look successful. forward to reading that plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not just funding for, for uh, it's not just staff, it's no. also funding for yeah. the entire program. Yeah. Right. Which means, okay, I can have a great urban forester on board. They're part of the city staff, it's a funded position, but if he doesn't have any equipment or any staff, what good is he or she? Mm -hmm. Right. It's more than just the position. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You need money to run the program, to operate the program as well. So there's a lot of things involved in it, which is why the challenges are there. So it's doable though, it's, it can be overcome. 
even in a city like San Juan. And San Juan, I think, Sharon, is this is sort of at an awkward size. You know, yeah. you look at Coeur d'Alene and especially the size and explosive growth that it's had, then, you know, they've had a full-time urban forester for, for many, many years. Post Falls was probably the next city in the area that they had a, 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 a full-time forester position. Sandpoint, you know, just, you know, given the salary and then also like, like Jim was saying, you need that support budget to implement a program, then it's going to require, you know, a, a, a pretty strong commitment from the, from the city to, to support something like that. But like Jim is saying, it could be done and, and maybe he'll give us the magic answer for that. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ways to talk about the problem. I mean, it's, uh, it may involve incremental steps. Um, Initially, maybe you um, have a, uh, a professional person like that on contract mm -hmm. as needed to come in and resolve these issues on a regular basis. They work a six month contract or something like that that the city can budget for. So, the powers that be, the politicians and the community, because it's really a function of the social economic structure of the community as well, whether they believe in this mm -hmm. and then you also have to have the political will to make this happen as well so, but the whole process mm -hmm. generates the support for all those avenues that we just talked about and there's successful ways of, of uh, honoring <coughs> favor for those types of things mm -hmm. All out there just needs to be applied to sampling. And, and I think one thing that uh, we've been working on is um, trying to get more information out to the public because I think the public has a, you know, the ability to be a tremendous asset. Um, I think we need to be able to educate the public both as you know, what the value of these trees are and you know, how important they are. A lot of people see them as being valuable. Um, but don't realize what what it takes to maintain them. So, um, so I think the, the more we can do to educate the public or, or make make them realize what an asset it really is, and um, the more likely they're going to be to support the city spending money on a, on a forest or, yeah. um, You know, the public can be a, a, a little ally here in. in Drumming up support for a city force to put this. That's you know, it's, it's a, it's a long hill to climb, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that, but, it, but I mean, we all know that when uh, if a big tree, a big prominent tree gets cut down, the um, city hears about it. Says, what's, what's going on? And sometimes it's an article in the newspaper. But, you know, these trees are, people do see these trees as something valuable. So they do take them for granted. Uh, many times too. But, and well, let's see. No, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. And then by its very name, urban forestry is a is a dichotomy. Urban, you think of streets, sidewalks, concrete buildings, things like that. Forest, you think of what's the beautiful mountainsides with trees and things like that. And so, for a lot of people, when just that you mentioned the term urban forestry, well, we're not urban. This isn't New York City or downtown Chicago and, and forests, you know, the forests are on the, on the mountains. So, well, that's, that's kind of the first hurdle that, that public education is, is what you call it an urban forest or, or like some communities do call, call it the community forest, but then get, you know, transfer that, that, that impression that yes, there are trees growing within the city and, and they comprise a forest. So we're at the top of the hour and um, I budgeted about an hour or so for this. Um, I didn't want to keep you guys here all afternoon because we could talk about this for hours on end. So any other real burning issues on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or threats that come to mind? I would like to say one of our strengths is that someone wrote the grant to ask you people to come and help us or guide us. Is that true? 
Yeah, somebody up here wrote the grant. That's what I mean. So that's encouraging. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, I should have mentioned um, one thing that's happened recently is we seem to be having more and more windstorms here. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Sure you've seen that in Spokane too. But, uh, and it's, it's really changed my thinking. Uh, you know, before, I used to think, well, we had a big windstorm. And all these big, big trees that made it through there are probably pretty, in pretty good shape. Um, but now it seems like every year we get one or two windstorms and trees are dropping all over the place. And, and uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I would have um, always encouraged someone to keep that tree in the past. Now I have to think twice about, well, how, you know, what, what would happen if this tree did get uh, uprooted or broke or so. Um, so it's a changing, real threat. It's kind of, I don't know if it's a changing climate issue. Um, it's definitely, but it's definitely a threat that, uh, that we, we face and um, we need to be able to uh, address the, what the impacts of that are on our, on our trees and, and on the public. Yeah. So, that will definitely be addressed in the plan, but briefly, I would flip the coin on that comment. So yeah, we've been experiencing more unusual weather patterns. We refer to it as climate disruption, not climate change. Climate disruption categorizes it as uh, more unusual storms in areas where they don't typically occur and of greater intensity. So the Northwest has had uh, quite a few windstorms over the last seven to 10 years, mm -hmm. which they don't typically experience. Washington had three documented tornadoes last year, unprecedented mm -hmm. in the history of weather in the state of Washington. So, and this isn't a local thing, this is worldwide phenomena. Foresters are tracking this, arborists are tracking this, it occurs everywhere in the world. So, on the other side of Bob's comment is, yeah, we had some tree failures, but how many are still standing? Right. It's a tiny, tiny percentage of trees that actually fail during storm events. A fair, I mean, it, it doesn't even register in the scope of risk management probability. <laughs> There's so few. It, the focus uh, by publicity is, they show all the trees that have failed and it looks like tree Armageddon to the public. No, it's true. But the fact of the matter is most of the trees did not fail. That's what you need to focus on. That's the education you have to provide to the public. And trees that fail during normal storm events, and what is normal? That's a meteorological term that is defined as a 30 year weather period in the area where you live. What's the normal weather pattern for that area? That's documented in every part of the country. The storms we've been having are not normal. So trees can withstand normal weather conditions in every area. They have adapted to that. When we get unusual weather patterns, and, it, and like these storms, the one we had in 2015, we hit up here too, but in Spokane, we had 90 mile an hour sustained winds with gusts higher than that. Mm -hmm. Trees that have no defects can fail in those. And you also have to look at what kind of failure it is. The trees that failed in that storm were not tree failures. And Bill may be the only one in the room that might understand this, maybe Rich. They were soil failures. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different thing in the world of tree risk management. Mm -hmm. The two are not equal. And no arborist or forester in the world can predict soil failures. Nobody. If they what's tell the, you that. What's the difference between a soil and like a root failure? Or is that? There's a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Yeah. What is it? So it's actually physics. I'll briefly I'll explain it. Oh, so when the, the two forces that operate on trees are gravity and wind. Gravity is a static force. Wind is a dynamic force. As it blows through the trees, the, ne the needles of the leaves start to move, the twigs start to move, the small branches start to move, the tertiary branches begin to move, the secondary branches begin to move, the scaffold branch branches begin to move. If the 
wind is strong enough, the trunk starts to move. The trunk moves. That's transferred down the trunk to the root system. And the roots begin to move. The trees have evolved with the wind. Mm -hmm. So a soil failure, what holds the tree up? The roots. And they hold it up by friction between the roots and the soil. So it's the friction, which is a force. So if the wind force is greater than the friction between the roots and the soil, it lifts the whole tree out of the ground. It rotates the entire tree out of the ground. And a soil failure has a very large flat pancake of roots. If it's a root failure, on the other hand, you will only see a small cup of roots at the base of the tree because the small, larger lateral roots and the small uh, absorbing roots, the fine roots, they've been destroyed for, for whatever reason, construction damage, root decay, root yeah. disease, anything. But you'll only see a small cup of roots at the base of the trunk. Or the tree's been buried below grade and it kills the root system off from construction grade changes. So someone that does risk assessment can do what, what we call forensic arboriculture, just like CSI. And we can look at these failures and we can tell exactly what caused the failure. So when people say my tree failed, it, that's a very glossed over uh, analysis of what caused the failure. So that's what we look at. When we do risk assessment, we're looking at those kind of things. So it's a very complicated process to do this. So back to the point is, yeah, we have tree failures, but most of those tree failures and those windstorms that have occurred here, trees with no defects can fail. Because if I ask you, Sharon or Rich or anybody in here, to extend your arms and hold up a five gallon bucket of sand. We're all going to fail. But some of us have more muscle capacity, which means we have greater carrying capacity to hold those things up. Trees have different carry capacity in their wood strength. Oaks are very strong wood, very durable wood. Cottonwood, willows, aspen, short lived trees, weaker wood, fail quicker, even with no defects. So there's a lot of things that go into this whole risk assessment. So when we start talking about tree failures, it gets really complicated and most people really don't have clear, clear understanding of the whole process. That will be a big section in the convention plan on this whole thing about tree risk assessment. How it should be done, what kind of plan you should have, who should be doing it, how often it should be done. It's not willy-nilly. Uh, get somebody out there. Even the average arborist doesn't necessarily know how to do tree risk assessment. We train. I, I'm actually one of the trainers for tree risk assessment qualification in the U.S. Three-day class. You have a written test and a field test to demonstrate your skill. So it's a very complicated task that is undertaken by arborists. So that's kind of a, a very brief explanation yeah thank you Good. yeah so that's uh some of the things that we discuss and we deal with um, you know as i was driving around and uh uh just to kind of wrap a few things up kind of some of the things that i saw just driving around and looking at things limited diversity the palette here starts at m and ends at m what happens if you get a disease or insect dust that likes maples? Like Norway. Norway. <laughs> no, not just Norway maple, all maples. Okay. Acer is a genus. If something affects uh, maples, it's usually going to affect all maples, mm. not just Norway. Mm. Take a look at Dutch elm disease. It affected all the American elms, slippery elms, mm. and to a certain degree, uh, Siberian elms. Look at emerald ash borer that was introduced in the country. It takes out every ash species. Diversity is a big issue up here. So you've got a ton of maples up here, not a lot of anything else. You've got a lot of trees that need work. Great to have a neighborhood's planting program. 
So you plant 800 trees. How many of those trees can you take care of? If you can't take care of 800 trees, why are you planting 800 trees? The analogy we use is, okay, you're going to have children. And once they're birthed, you walk away from them for 25 years, what kind of end product are you going to have? The mature trees here need work, and they've been neglected for a long time. So those are some of the things that just drive by seeing wow. things. Lightning. So those are some of the things we'll talk about in the plan and address. So there's a lot of things going on up here that are weaknesses, but they're also opportunities to build the program and also to address the things that you guys have talked about. How do we get the public to understand this? Well, the public doesn't know these things. You guys didn't know these things to some degree. If you guys don't know it and you're the, the tree committee, then how do you expect the public to understand these as well? So some of the roles that you guys have traditionally had, which is why I asked how long you've been on the committee, some of the roles that you guys might have traditionally might be changing more from a policy oriented group to more of a, of a public outreach administrative type role. Um, you're still engaged, but in a different type of manner. So those are some of the things we'll look at too. Is what are, what's the role of the tree committee in, in moving this thing forward? Um, so those are a lot of things that will be addressed in the plan. So. It's going to be a, a far reaching wide topic plan covers like benefits, pruning practices, planting practices, ordinance. What we're going to look at your ordinance and see what's missing. Like you guys talked about enforcement. That's part of it, but you know, there's other things before enforcement that have to be in place as well, too. So if there is the political will to enforce an ordinance, <coughs> Whether it's the tree ordinance or any ordinance, if nobody's going to enforce it, it's not worth anything. It's not even worth the papers written on. So, but you got to have some practices in place. Where where's the arboriculture specs and standards that the contractors have to run by to do the work properly? Are they following industry standards? You know, those kind of things. So, that's briefly some things we'll be looking at. How long do you think it takes to create your plan? Um, I hope to have it done by the end of June or mid July. Oh. So how, Jim, how are you getting um, other public input, the general public? A couple of things. Process. We're going to do this same thing. We're going to have a public meeting coming up. Um, we decided on June 3rd. On that same day, we'll also be meeting with all city staff to, uh, and we're also going to put together a survey. I go out to the public as well. So between those, that'll be it. Keep in mind that every urban forestry program thrives on an occasional crisis, and we're kind of between crises right now. So we we need a good crisis to kind of rally the troops. And, and I'm excited. We'll I feel like things are going to start coalescing. <coughs> It's a good start. It is really a, a good start. So um, it will be a thing that you can use as a tool. Yeah. To and have our forward. goals clearly defined too. We yeah, for you nice. and the public. Because like you said, you know, Bob <clears throat> mentioned it. They don't really know who we are and what we do. Yeah. So that's kind of how we gotta take this thing off. Communicate. And, and, and really this is, you know, the, the city, the current city administration, uh, you know, is, is focusing in this direction for virtually all of the, the city programs. And I think the administrator has recognized, yeah, there's all of these little individual programs doing their own thing, uh, but not a unified direction. And, and so, so I think we're the, the, the small part of that. And, and, and consequently, I think we will be listened to uh, more readily in the in the future. Absolutely, that's one of the strengths that the city is doing. Mm -hmm. That process that they're doing is going to integrate all these committees mm -hmm. into interdependency, working together, mm -hmm. so that the public works has a project that involves our impacts trees. Then urban forestry has a seat at that table yeah. before the bulldozers out there. Right. Yeah. 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 That's how this works. Yeah. 
And that's what they're trying to do. And believe me, that has been a giant hurdle for city staff that are working on that. Yeah. Have you seen that successfully implemented yeah. in other oh, absolutely. cities our size? That oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We've worked with some big cities and small cities and in, all in between. And once these plans are in place and once we go through this process, typically we find things like um, a lot of cities that we've done this for in Montana, uh, those cities have already had urban forestry assessments in place for property owners. They pay a flat fee every year that goes directly into urban forestry. Mm -hmm. We've been able to get those assessments doubled and get people hired in addition to those assessments after going through these kind of processes. So we've, we've had those kind of successes uh, throughout uh, our experience of working with cities. So it is, uh, it's, uh, it's going to take time. Yeah. You guys are still a baby. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not wanting to get into the politics of it by, by any means. You know, the, the difference between a, a strong mayor organization uh, versus uh, a, a city administrator type, type position. And up until Sandpoint adopted that city administrator concept, well, then it was always the mayor uh, you know, uh, proposing and <laughs> implementing their goals for the, for the city and that sort of thing. And, you know, they weren't trained to be mayor. They just ran for election and then were elected. But, but you know, for, for, for the first time in Sandpoint's history, the current administration, it has, you know, trained people trained in administering public administration. Yeah. And so they're able to visualize, yeah, this, this, this comprehensive, you know, working together of approach. And so I think we're just now starting to see, you know, some of the results of, of that. And then what, for what it was worth politically, I didn't think Sandpoint needed a city administrator, but two or three years later, I'm starting to see that the, the vision that's, that's, that, that's working for it. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I'm sure we'll be seeing each other again in the like process. So, <laughs> I'm going to come back again. I will. Okay. Mr. Chairman, could I um, make one query? Um, there is a regular tree committee meeting scheduled for this coming Monday. Is the desire to still hold that meeting or I we've would, just approved our minutes from last month? I was not planning on it. Um, I'm just kind of busy talking here, but if I don't pay with everyone else, will that be here? Okay. Yeah. I think we'll um, skip that one and choose um, for a June June meeting with this. Melissa, could you send me the link for that? Meeting? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, meeting, I guess, is adjourned 423. Thanks. Oh.